today we're talking about history of the internet. And, um, yes, we're getting to contemporary times, pretty much, in terms of what we're studying. Um, next week it's mobile, so we're kind of concentrating just on the development of uh, wired internet right now, which for a long time was the only game in town, but now mobile has changed the game again. So that's pretty cool. Uh, next class, I'd like to get to uh, a topic that's at the end of the textbook, which is net neutrality, and uh, you know some of the, some of the issues that have arisen now that the internet is um, so ubiquitous. Uh, even just in reading some of the stuff in the textbook, I was feeling like, okay, you know, there's there's at least two sides to a lot of what's being said in the textbook and as, as the technology evolves and our use of it's evolving, it seems like there's more, uh, more downsides are, are rearing their uh, potentially ugly heads, even although the beginning of all of this was couched in very utopian terms. Like the mid-90s when I started doing my studies, it was like the internet will democratize everything. You know? it's like, here we are, democracy. <laughs> Democracy at work. As the story is often told, and one of my colleagues at my old job was vehemently against the story, by the way, he wrote a whole book and spent a couple of years in Silicon Valley sort of interviewing folks who disagreed with some of this history, but let's just stick to the history in the textbook and not muddy the waters, I guess. But uh, uh, word has it that uh, the internet came out of uh, defense projects. And the idea was to uh, create a communications infrastructure that was decentralized, that could survive um, an attack uh, on our communication system. Uh, and this uh, was, uh, of course, going alongside uh, work in academia, um, which was basically trying to connect computers to each other to make them more powerful. And uh, so, so out, of, out of those two sorts of interests came the project of DARPAnet, um, which was to uh, uh, link together commuter, computers uh, in the defense research area that could also prove, prove a concept for a bigger communications network that was decentralized and couldn't be knocked out. Um, so we can look at a video on that in a second, but um, there, you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of concerns about privacy, about the NSA monitoring data streams, and one thing that I think that came out of that, which was quite interesting, to me, who had been schooled in this notion that uh, the, the internet is a, uh, you know, decentralized communication system. Uh, was to find out that huge sections of the internet run through physical servers that were basically unprotected in very, you know, accessible geographic locations. So although we can draw you graphics with, you know, computers all over the place sending webs of information everywhere, you know, when it came down to the NSA wanting to tap the flow of communications, you know, before they entered the country if they were trying to be legal about it or something, it, they could go to a few locations and the actual servers were there, despite all this picture of decentralization. So I found that quite an interesting sort of contrast to the, you know, to the story as it's told. It's all over the place, but in fact, it, could, it, uh, it, it converges in certain places which are were easy enough to tap into. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So uh, we got a video on some of the early parts of uh, the history. And uh, which one is this one? Okay. Wow, so many views. So many what? So many views. Oh, yeah. It's a big day for video because we're, we're into the current, the current era now. <laughs> so this one features uh, Vint Cerf, Vinton Cerf, who's uh, often identified as the father of the internet. Uh, because he was central to a lot of the early research, and he's emerged sort of as the public face of, of that period. So, Vint Cerf, the father of the internet.
What is the internet? There he is. The internet is like a popular thing. Some satellites up there. I picture in my head with like waves of internet going to the phone. Somebody told me a cloud once. The internet is a lot like plumbing. It's always moving. Most people don't have any idea where the internet came from, and it is, doesn't matter. They don't need to. It's sort of like asking who invented the ballpoint pen or the flush toilet or, you know, the zipper. These are all things we just use every day, and we don't even think about the fact that one day somebody invented them. So the internet is just like that. Many, many years ago, in the early 1970s, my partner Bob Kahn and I began working on the design of what we now call the internet. It was a result of another experiment called the ARPANET, which stood for Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. It was a Defense Department research project. Paul Barron was trying to figure out how to build a communication system that might actually survive a nuclear attack. So he had this idea of breaking messages up into blocks and sending them as fast as possible in every possible direction through the mesh network. So we built a what eventually became a nationwide experimental packet network, and it worked. Is anybody in charge of the internet? The government controls it. Elves, obviously elves. The people who control the Wi-Fi, because then no Wi-Fi, no internet. T-Mobile, um, Xfinity. Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill Gates. Bill Gates. The honest answer is, well, nobody, and, and maybe another answer is everybody. The real answer is that the Internet is made up of an incredibly large number of independently operated networks. What's interesting about the system is that it's fully distributed. There's no central control that's deciding how packets are routed or where pieces of uh, network are built or even who interconnects with whom. These are all business decisions that are made independently by the operators. They are all motivated to assure that there is end-to-end -end connectivity of every part of the network because the utility of the net is that any device can communicate with any other device just like you want to be able to make phone calls to any other telephone in the world. There's nothing like this that has ever been built before. The idea that what you know might be useful to somebody else or vice versa is a very powerful motivator for sharing information. By the way, that's how science gets done. People share information. So this is an opportunity for people to think up new applications, maybe program them as apps on a mobile phone, maybe become part of the continued growth of the infrastructure of the network to bring it to people that don't have access to it yet, or just make use of it on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't escape from contact with the internet, so why not get to know it and use it? So there we heard from the legendary Vint, Vint Cerf, the father of the internet, although he's not trying to call himself that, but that's just like Marconi was supposedly the inventor of the wireless. But, um, and also, I mean, a key piece of information that we saw in there, and we can look at another video that's a little more technical about the whole thing, but it's the idea that the internet uh, is a distributed network of computers and also that information moves around it in packets. So it's what's called a packet switch network. And uh, what that means is that, you know, any digital information, which we know just audio, video, text now can be uh, rendered out as streams of digits, right? Through various ingenious methods of analyzing audio and video and coding them. And we go into that in DCST 119, so we don't want to necessarily repeat much of it here. But uh, once that information is digitized, um, and it uh, can be broken into packets and sent through the network to a given address. You know? So like in your web browser, if you load up a page in your web browser, the browser is calling out for files that are perhaps distributed very widely on the network. You know, definitely the advertising that will appear on your page is served up by a computer that's somewhere physically quite different than where the content of the page would be served up from as well. And all of it's pulled together in this app that we call a browser, which we'll see was quite a 
quite a big invention in the mid-1990s to actually get a browser that could pull all of these files that were up on the internet together. Now, let's say you're loading up a picture on a page there. The, uh, the packets of information that compose those pictures may take a very different route through the internet before they wind up in your browser all assembled together. Uh, so uh, this is part of the distributed architecture allows for chunking things into packets and sending them down the most efficient route which the system itself decides on on a you know a moment by moment basis as to where the packets will be routed to. So it's a pretty amazing technology and, and of course uh, it's also amazing that it works so well and, and what we see generally when a, a page loads up through a broadband network we'll see audio, video, text you know, basically load up at once on the screen, even though there are a lot of complex things that are going on in the background. You know, the different elements on the page are being routed to you differently. And um, of course, you know also that there's probably an auction going on uh, selling the, uh, the ad space on your, on your page in real time. So, um, in, you know, in addition to, uh, to just loading up the page elements also in the background, uh, there may be uh, a little exchange of information regarding what's your browsing history, what kind of cookies is your browser showing to uh, the, uh, the ad server, and then the ad server conducting a mini auction based on prior bids that have been set up within it for, by different advertisers saying, uh, if it's somebody who's interested in shoes, we're willing to bid you know, uh, an extra two cents on, the, on, on this or something like that. And, of course, all that's pre-programmed in advance, so when you show up and you happen to have been looking on Zappos uh, product placement, by the way, uh, <laughs> but so when, you, when you've been doing that, there's a cookie on your, on your browser, and Zappos will say, oh, he was on here a couple days ago, so let's, let's go for that, and boom, uh, uh, you know, a, a targeted ad will now appear on your, uh, on your browser. Have people had that creepy kind of uh, experience lately? Yeah. Any, anything really extreme? I'll have to tell you, a while back, uh, I was looking for organic tuna fish. So the next time I'm lecturing in class, sorry, it's like this cover, page covered in ads for tuna fish. <laughs> Why? You know, it was just, what can I say? Had any good stories like that to tell? No? I look okay. up pet videos a lot. Sandra? Yeah. Um, my dog is 15 and has uh, cancer, so I ordered him uh, Cannabis dog treats. Oh, okay. And that's uh, that's sad. Your dog is not well. But. Yeah, he's good. He's good. But um, yeah, right. like, I I don't know what the internet thinks of me. Like I'm just getting the weirdest ads for like <laughs> like all the yeah, cannabis related stuff. That's a good one. Does it help him? Yeah. Yeah. Some sleep. Feel feel better. Yeah. Okay, cool. So just, just some, some of the implications of this packet switch network, then, which he said was, was good for defense in terms of its decentralization and also just for if, if part of the internet slows due to too much traffic, the packets may instantly take another route out to where they want it to go. Is there a finite of information that packets can hold or is it more complicated than that? That is all part of this thing called TCP IP, the internet protocols that were set up. I think the next video will address when those protocols set up. So I don't have a deep knowledge of those. Uh, but basically, the idea is that everybody has to be on the same, using the same protocol to understand, OK, here's this information coming at us. How is it chunked? How should we reassemble it as it comes to us? So part of the protocol would be like, how big are the packets? And also, how are we going to identify the packet? Let's say we got a picture. We break it into packets of I don't know how many bytes each. But we need to know then, like, what was the ordering of those packets so that we can reorder them later on. You know? So within a system like that, there will be both information about address, like where this is supposed to go, and information about the client side, like what, where, what, how was this stacked originally before it was split into packets and stuff. So all of that is, you know, TCP IP has been 
they, they, there's the, the W3 consortium, which is the kind of global advisory that sets up the standards on which the internet runs, including the HTML standards, uh, which we'll get to HTML in a second. So, so they, they are um, uh, responsible for updating and, and sort of stewarding those, those protocols. Protocol is another idea for protocol would just be like a language. If one computer has to talk to another, they got to talk the same language. And so it's like, but as to exactly the, the technical aspects of you know the, 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 the packeting, if you want, I'm not sure. I know this also extends to our cell phone carriers and operators too. Like Verizon's on a particular scheme called CDMA, which is a way of splitting the packets to distribute wirelessly. And then AT&T AT is on a different sort of protocol as well. Again, it's all packets of information, but they're different. So somewhat incompatible. Which when we went into Iraq, we basically like destroyed all the cellular infrastructure there to start with and put our own in so that you know, it was good for Verizon or <laughs> for our tech. So, um, just little extras that we do for, for American corporations that most of us don't know about. Uh, and there were hands up. All of you had your hand up? No, something? Any, anybody else? Yeah, Gino? Uh, one that I found kind of interesting and also weird was that I went on my computer and I was on a website called MerchConnection.com because I was looking at Merch for a band because I was interested in getting a long sleeve. Um, and then, like, sometime later, I go on my phone and I go on Facebook and then Facebook shows this ad to me of, like, the same website. And I wasn't on Facebook itself on my computer at the time. But yeah. Facebook shows me an ad for the website with like that specific item that I was oh. looking at too. And it's like obsessed with band name and it showed me their merch like selection. That's interesting. So that was a little weird. Right, right. Yeah. So so then you're you're trying to figure like how do these cookies work or whatever? How do they know what I was looking on on one device uh, on another device in a different platform, basically, right? Because because Facebook is, I mean, we can talk about this next class maybe, but Facebook is replacing for a lot of people. It's replacing the web, you know. I mean, uh, and in, in some countries, there's a you know, you can get Facebook and a few other websites and stuff, and they'll basically give you that on your mobile. Your mobile operator will give you that connectivity, like super limited, but it'll come with your phone. And if you're in a country which you know you're not going to buy a laptop because you can't afford that kind of plethora of devices. That for you could be the internet. You know, basically Facebook plus a few things. So think about that when, you know, we talk about net neutrality in this country, it's like, well, we should all get access to everything. But in some countries you're just getting Facebook and a couple other things. That's that's the dominance of a platform there. It's dangerous. Nika and then all of you. I notice whenever I go to uh, refill my clipper card for several days or weeks afterward. I will get mostly ads about motor, like ex really expensive motorized skateboards hmm. and like hoverboards and like kind of new hipsterish kind of techie types of travel. And I'll just get bombarded with pretty much exclusively that for the next couple of days. That's interesting. And you think that that's because they know that you're shopping for transportation? You're spending money on transportation? Well, so the maybe you'd like, prefer. Well, the ads are like, skip the bus. Ah. Uh -huh. Is there confirmation through your Gmail account? Yeah. Yeah, that probably is where the, the information leaks yeah. out, right? Because the privilege of having free Gmail means they can scan all of your Gmail. Oh, hey, Gopal, we should talk at the end of class, OK? Yeah, hey, Olive? So I know that the good old government right now is uh, definitely watching the internet, i.e. Twitter mostly. Um, was there any major issues when internet came to be with the government? Like, did they disagree with how things were run or not run? Was there a major concern? Interesting question. I, yeah, I, I don't know the history of that. That's, that's a good point. I mean, clearly, it, it, a, a lot of the original technology was, was uh, you know, came out of government research. Uh, but as to whether there were some attempts to kind of shape and curtail it. I don't remember hearing much about that. Because most of this is just uh, technological. Right, right. Yeah, and you're thinking more in terms of the policy constraints on it and such. Yeah. So, uh, well, we can 
We can look for that before our next class and see if we can find that. Good, good question. Well, let's let's check this one out while we're talking about uh, the tech aspect of it. Um, but if it turns out to be a slog, I'll cut it before we get to the end. The internet in the year 2009. We send emails, make calls over the internet, and discuss topics we take an interest in. Even our banking is going virtual. But what we take for granted today was only a vague idea 50 years ago. In order to understand how we got this far, let's go back to 1957, when everything began. Before 1957, computers only worked on one task at a time. This is called batch processing. Of course, this was quite ineffective. With computers getting bigger and bigger, they had to be stored in special cooled rooms. But then the developers couldn't work directly on the computers anymore. Specialists had to be called in to connect them. Programming at that time meant a lot of manual work and the indirect connection to the computers led to a lot of bugs, wasting time and fraying the developers' nerves. Yeah. The year 1957 marked a big change. A remote connection had to be installed so that the developers could work directly on the computers. At the same time, the idea of time sharing came up. This is the first concept in computer technology to share the processing power of one computer with multiple users. On October 4th in 1957, during the Cold War, the first unmanned satellite Sputnik 1 was sent into orbit by the Soviet Union. The fear of a missile gap emerged. In order to secure America's lead in technology, the US founded the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in February 1958. At that time, knowledge was only transferred by people. The DARPA planned a large-scale computer network in order to accelerate knowledge transfer and avoid the doubling up of already existing research. This network would become the ARPANET. Furthermore, three other concepts were to be developed which are fundamental for the history of the Internet. The concept of a military network by the RAND Corporation in America. The commercial network of the National Physical Laboratory in England and the scientific network Cyclades in France. The scientific, military and commercial approaches of these concepts are the foundations for our modern internet. Let's begin with the ARPANET, the most familiar of these networks. Its development began in 1966. Universities were generally quite cautious about sharing their computers, therefore small computers were put in front of the mainframe. This computer, the Interface Message Processor, took over control of the network activities, while the mainframe was only in charge of the initialization of programs and data files. At the same time, the IMP also served as interface for the mainframe. Since only the IMPs were interconnected in a network, this was also called IMP subnet. For the first connections between the computers, the Network Working Group developed the Network Control Protocol. Later on, the NCP was replaced by the more efficient Transmission Control Protocol. The specific feature of the TCP is the verification of the file transfer. Let's take a short detour to England. Since the NPL network was designed on a commercial basis, a lot of users and file transfer were expected. In order to avoid congestion of the lines, the sent files were divided into smaller packets which were put together again at the receiver. Packet switching was born. In 1962, American ferret aircraft discovered middle and long-range missiles in Cuba, which were able to reach the United States. This stoked fear of an atomic conflict. At that time, information systems had a centralized network architecture. To avoid breakdown during an attack, a decentralized network architecture had to be developed, which, in case of loss of a node, would still be operative. Communication still used to work through radio waves. That would have caused problems in case of an atomic attack. 
the ionosphere would be affected and the long wave radio waves wouldn't work anymore. Therefore, they had to use direct waves, which, however, don't have a long range. A better solution was the model of a distributed network. Thus, long distances could be covered with a minimum of interference. Another milestone followed with the development of the French network Cyclades. Since Cyclades had a far smaller budget than ARPANET, and thus also fewer nodes, Hi, the focus was laid on the communication with other networks. In this way, the term Internet was born. Moreover, Suclade's concept went further than ARPA's and the MPLs. During communication between sender and receiver, the computers were not to intervene anymore, but simply serve as a transfer node. Suclade's protocol went through all machines using a physical layer that was implemented into the hardware, providing a direct connection with the receiver, an end-to-end -end structure. Inspired by the Suclades network and driven by the incompatibility between the networks, their connection gained in importance everywhere. The phone companies developed the X.25 protocol, which enabled communication through their servers, in exchange for a monthly basic charge, of course. DARPA's transmission control protocol was to connect the computers through gateways. Yeah, I'm teaching and the International Organization for Standardization designed the OSI reference model. The innovation of OSI was the attempt to standardize the network from its ends and the channel's division into separate layers. Finally, the TCP assimilated the preferences of the OSI reference model and gave way to the TCP IP protocol a standard which guaranteed compatibility between networks and finally merged them, creating the Internet. By February the 28th, 1990, the ARPANET hardware was removed. But the Internet was up and running. Okay, so I guess there's more in there about the genesis of TCP IP and the, you know, the languages that computers can speak to each other to exchange the data like that. I uh, don't think we need to be as technical going forward as that, that thing was there. Uh, cool. Uh, we should make the distinction between the internet and the World Wide Web. So the internet being the interconnected computers which operate on the internet protocol. Um, which means that those computers know how they how they are exchanging data um, on top of the internet within within the internet, still using uh, the internet protocol, but uh, with a different coding language, uh, the HTML, the hypertext markup language, which we have the World Wide Web, which uh, uh, is commonly credited to Tim Berners Lee who was a researcher in uh, the European Laboratory of Particle Physics, wanted to give researchers just there in that particular organization a platform for sharing their, uh, their scientific papers and findings. And so um, had a server in his office. You can still see it. I'm not sure if it's in the Museum of Computing in Silicon Valley here, but it was just basically a kind of black box server. And uh, um, he wrote the first draft, the basis of HTML. So what was interesting there was this business of hyperlinking, that you could embed within a document a link that would call out to another document, and you could load that into your computer, the idea of being you know, that you could uh, uh, facilitate research by, let's say, somebody's talking about something they published in another paper, you could put a link to it right there, and the people who are learning this stuff could link right to it. And that wasn't Bernard Lee's uh, idea. That idea had been out there uh, in a, in a non-implemented form before, people saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could just click on something and see another document and see another document? But he kind of made that happen in, in, a, in an actual implementation uh, with HTML. So uh, 
that was uh, where the, the, the World Wide Web came from at that point. What we've got then by the mid-1990s is the internet, uh, an increasingly interconnected network of computers. We're starting to see it being used as a mass medium. So the original text and hypertext basis of the web, slowly through, the, there are different iterations of HTML. I think we're on HTML 5 or 6 now, I think. So uh, they've rewritten HTML. Computing uh, interconnectivity has improved, so we can obviously send audio, send video uh, through broadband connections. So containing text, graphics, sound, video, and the convergence, in this case, we're talking about the convergence of those different media. You know, TV was just TV, radio was just radio, recorded music was just recorded music, and the way it can all come together now in some multimedia uh, productions that, you know, that are all on the web and we have a convergent media certificate where we try to do, uh, you know, address just those types of uses, multimedia use of, uh, of broadband connected um, uh, computers, right? And I'm just thinking I should, we should also talk just broadband in the sense that in, in the early days of uh, personal computing and the internet, um, you've probably seen movies or heard stories about uh, uh, the data exchange happening through analog phone lines, which meant that uh, the, uh, the, the, the packets had to be turned into an audio form to get from your home to you know, your telephone company. And so they used what was called a modem, right? And so you've probably heard in movies and stuff like, you know, as the, that's the modem you know, basically establishing a connection. Uh, from your home to the server at the phone company, and after that, that information would get sent. So in the mid-90s, connecting to the World Wide Web would take a minute or two just to get that going, and then, of course, your phone was probably tied up, so then people got two lines, right? And uh, so did you guys experience any of this? Or, yes. yes? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Yes. Remember the commercials for morning. WWW? World Wide Web had their own commercials. Did they really? Yeah. Oh, gosh, how did someone manage to brand that? Interesting. It was always AOL. I was always AOL. 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 It was an AOL, AOL thing. Little guy running. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. AOL. 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 Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So, so that was uh, that was uh, typically 56 kilobits per second. Uh, it's very slow. Uh, enough enough so that you could download an MP3 file, let's say, uh, would take a while, right? <laughs> but but streaming, streaming was not something at the time, right? So, uh, but um, broadband, there's a, there's a few different varieties of what we call broadband, but that's a faster internet connection, basically, either through a cable provider or a phone company. Uh, there was uh, a, a DSL was uh, still probably the most common form of, of broadband. So that would move at much faster speeds, like let's say six megabits per second or something. So like maybe, uh, what's that, 100 times faster data transfer than uh, your 56K. And then uh, you uh, now, um, I don't know what you guys are using, but uh, more and more you've got a fiber optic connection which would give you in the gigabits, so it, theoretically close to a gigabit per, uh, uh, per second of, of data transfer, uh, but in fact, far lower, in, in usually, based on how far you are from the infrastructure. So, so, you know, starting with DSL, it becomes possible to stream audio and video, and then they got better at compressing it all. So, so we had, you know, the, the uh, we have tele what, was, what was once television and radio and recorded music now moving on to the internet as, as we all know it and how that's disrupted uh, all of those industries, right? Uh, so let's just move on here for a sec. So we talked about the infrastructure. We, we saw quite a lot. Um, Packet switch network, that's important. TCP IP, we kind of covered that as the, the language that the computers speak to exchange data between them. Um, the DNS domain name system. So uh, this is um, uh, basically the addresses on the network 
are um, attributed based on uh, the, the, the DNS domain name system. And so uh, what this means is that some, some addresses on the network are dynamically uh, assigned. So when a computer joins the network, they'll get a number just attributed like that. Some, some numbers are, and names are uh, in a directory, and you have to you know, uh, basically uh, uh, claim those. And ICANN is the um, organization that keeps track of all those names. Um, and so the DNS name system, typically when you do a search or when your computer's trying to connect to a, 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 a particular resource like Canvas, um, it will it will uh, send out it'll send out the call to Canvas, but that'll go through a DNS server, which basically says, "Oh, they want Canvas. What is the actual port that Canvas is connected to here?" Um, so I had a little bit of a scare over the summer because I came back from vacation. I'm trying to connect to Canvas, and through Sonic, which is my IP, my internet provider, can't get to Canvas. Can't get to Canvas. Why is that? Call Sonic. Oh, well, you know, we're called CCSF. Like, what's going on? Why can't it? Finally, it turns out that CCSF changed their RAM ID uh, address through DNS, but Sonic didn't update it. So basically, Sonic was actually at fault. Surprisingly, CCSF did what it should do. And so, so you know, they, they actually called Sonic and say, hey, can you can you update your DNS because everyone at CCSF is not getting to Canvas, which of course would be incredibly frustrating for you guys when you arrive, right? Like a week later, the thing wouldn't have been functioning if you were with Sonic. So that was interesting to find that out. Um, yeah. Um, so at some point, you know, with the, with the web especially, you're looking at a point where we can talk about the internet at least the World Wide Web part of the internet. So the World Wide Web operates within the internet, just on a different set of protocols with a different language. Uh, but it's uh, um, you know we can talk about mass media because people are you know large numbers of people are streaming and and you know whether it's synchronous with internet radio or asynchronous with podcasts and and uh, uh, downloads and stuff. Um, we're talking about the mass distribution of, of, of media, entertainment, especially and information that we typically come to know today. So uh, I guess the, 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 the last piece that is um, an important piece of this history is uh, the browser. Because there was a time in the, uh, T Tim Berners-Lee did not have a browser, for instance. He was using HTML coded documents, so you would open up the document on your computer, and it would have a hypertext link in it. But this idea of a browser as a software application that could pull together uh, all, the, all, all the different uh, resources on a web page and lay them out in function of you know, the codes that are in the HTML document, which is the basis of every web page, um, there wasn't an app to interpret that. Uh, before Mosaic, which was the creation of a, a graduate student. Uh, and uh, so we have a, a, a video on that that we could uh, maybe end the class up. I was hoping to do that. Because it's an interesting history. Basically, you had Microsoft, which was the dominant um, player in, in personal computing at the time, who were very much tied to you know, a local computer Type of setup, you know, where they 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 had, you know, the Windows operating system uh, installed in like 90% of the computers, all personal computers all over the world. They had basically a monopoly situation there. Um, and what happens when all of a sudden, you know, the internet becomes a thing and people can, you know, do all sorts of things that the, the Microsoft has no part of. You know, so they had to. They, they muscled into that territory pretty aggressively. It, it's an interesting uh, little bit of history. So maybe we could come back and look at that. Uh, but you know, based on the, um, the evolving access to what we're calling broadband, right, which is high-speed internet interconnectivity, um, we have been able to you know, begin streaming 
uh, audio and video, which has made, made a, a big difference. And uh, we've seen, you know, just early on, this is discussed in the adequate amount of detail in the, in the book. And did, did anybody write about Napster in their, in their uh, essays uh, or touch on Napster or the, the, the later forms of internet radio that followed it and stuff? Be It'll be included. Awesome. Be included. Awesome. Great. So, uh, uh, yeah, there's, uh, y y you know, uh, the Napster model and um, LimeWire, some, some that probably I'm not even aware of, but, uh, you know, the, the model was basically uh, uh, individuals would post files <coughs> on servers on the internet, uh, and Napster or LimeWire were basically directories that were helping people uh, get a hold of those files, share files, yeah. Which is how they managed to, you know, skirt, skirt legality uh, because they weren't actually offering the files up. They were just facilitating the connection. Um, so that was enough early on to, you know, break people into the idea of, you know, basically not paying for music, but being able to uh, find, find what you want uh, through, through a service like Napster or LimeWire, uh, which you know, basically would connect individuals on the network to, to the files that were posted and that they wanted, right? Um, so, you know, that's obviously rocked the music industry, and uh, um, that's, um, <clears throat> well, you know, we've seen, we've seen the turn towards streaming as, as, a, as a, an alternative to, uh, to piracy <laughs> provided by the provided by the industry, and that hasn't maybe been all that great for for music creators either. You know, just in a sense that uh, I mean, it, it seems to me that that the the royalties and the, the 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 income distribution out of online streaming has come nowhere near to matching what the old school shipping vinyl records to, or CDs even to stores was able to provide for, for creatives. You know, I guess you could argue that many more people can participate now than they used to, but it just seems like such a struggle for just about everybody in the music business now. Yeah. Um, seems like before the internet, though, like music, the music business was always the hardest art form to get your money in, so that didn't help. Yeah. But it, it seemed like it was the hardest one to do. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to get people to want to pay to listen to 12 songs. It's 15 bucks. So. Gotcha. Yeah, and that, that in part was the greed of the record companies in the CD era, yeah. especially. They, I think they went you know, above and beyond <laughs> uh, greed. But, you know, that's that. I mean, there's, there's a structural thing about what's called the cultural industries, you know, which is it's, whether we're talking film and television or music, you know, the, the unpaid talent pool is gigantic. It's it's almost uh, it, it it's unheard of that uh, you know you'd be in plumbing, and uh, you want so much to be a plumber that you'd work for free, you know, for perhaps your whole career, with the hope that you know there's a one in one in ten chance that you might actually get paid for it sometime, you know, versus that's just what we assume about the entertainment business, you know, you're. You do it because you love it, and there's some chance that you might make some money at it, or even strike really rich. But uh, mostly, you know, the, this, the big entertainment corporations feed off of the creativity and endless energies of, of an almost unpaid talent pool, and that's been a part of, of film and TV before the internet, for sure. Gino, I know you're into music, and you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, nowadays, like when new albums come out from bands, I don't. Like, I tend to go to Amoeba and Rescue the Box because I love buying physical CDs and stuff. Um, but I don't really see, like, a lot of copies of, like, the new stuff that comes out because it's more, uh, like, people like to buy direct from the band. Like, they'll go on an associated merch store that the band is connected with or they'll go on their band camp and then um, that's where all the pre-orders come and then it just ships directly from the band to the customer and not out to a store where, you know, you'll see, like, on your copies or whatever. Right. Like, if you go to a store, maybe you'll see, like, one or two copies of the vinyl and maybe three copies of the CD at the most. 
Interesting. So you're saying that a savvy consumer can support their, their you know, the people they're passionate about better directly than you know going through iTunes or that might take a huge cut out of what they buy. Yeah, for sure. And and I guess your other point goes to retail and. Uh, you know, record stores used to be run like supermarkets. You know, you'd, they'd, you'd, they'd, the record companies would pay to stock their stuff in the store, you know, and those could pay more would stock it more prominently or you'd have a bigger catalog. And, and you know, the, the records would move in and they, they wouldn't even ask for them back. You know, they would like drill a hole in the back of an album and just like sell it for nothing. You know, it's just like, don't send it back to us, just, you know, uh, just just sell it for what you can get or something like that. So, so the old record business was you know really uh, it was a lot more like a supermarket. And, and so uh, wasn't it like that at like Blockbuster and, and uh, video stores? I'm not so sure how they worked. Yeah, but dev I worked in a record store when I was in college, and that's that's how it all worked. Yeah. And the big bit of wisdom they had there was radio sells records. If it gets played on radio, we'll sell a ton of it. If it doesn't get radio play, we won't sell it. That was a pretty, you know, well-stocked store too. It was gigantic. So, yeah, it's uh, now you can get anything. Of course, that incredible archive that's online but it doesn't seem to be supporting creatives all that well. That's perhaps my view. Uh, so. Uh, what else we got to talk? I mean, just the idea that old media uh, has, you know, and we talked about this before, you know, we came to the conclusion, which I think is sound, that, uh, uh, you know, terrestrial radio stations use the internet to extend their audience. And, uh, and so it's, it's best to, to approach, you know, what this kind of, uh, uh, what our new, entertainment industries have going, it's best to approach it um, not with the idea that uh, digital media competes with, you know, old, old terrestrial media, uh, that digital radio necessarily takes away from uh, terrestrial radio, but rather it's very often a kind of a compliment. You know? I think we did talk about Clear Channel as a uh, behind iHeartRadio. In fact, it rebranded itself completely, changed the company identity to become iHeartRadio. Um, even, even as it still maintains a ton of, of terrestrial radio stations because it's, they're using internet radio as a complement to terrestrial radio. So that's... You know, just, uh, and just to add to that, um, in terms of internet radio, I look at my generation we do internet radio. People are still going to work every morning, so they want their morning cup of coffee, their KBLX. They want to be able to enter to win concert tickets, go to the comedy shows. I mean, you know, folks in my generation, we still are part of that particular uh, entertainment, you know, source. Mm, mm. So when KBLX went through, or for example, KPFA, and many of you guys know about it in Berkeley, I mean, that radio station got hit really hard about maybe five to seven years ago. I mean, people really wanted to shut them down. Mm. And the community came together, the grassroots community came together and said, if you kill local radio, you might as well just kill all of us because our freedom for express, you know, so we really pushed the, 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 the Constitution. But radio has to live because that, that, that again, that population of people, we're still living. And we're still active, and even more so, you've got Black Lives Matter now, and you know, you've got the hurricanes where FEMA's not responding, so you have all those environmental people. So radio definitely has to stay alive because now we're we're almost approaching that age of where we're the elders, we're the leaders now. So how do we hear our voices collectively? It's gotta stay on radio, because many of us are not on social media. Not over on the radio. Yeah. But but that puts us on social media because girl, you better hit me on Facebook, right? right. So that we right. can continue right. the conversation. Well, if you're gonna find out about it, then all the details are on Facebook. Gotcha. So so they really work hand in hand, Facebook and radio. So I think that's really what's helping to right. keep radio like current 
And KPFA like streams, too, for oh, those yeah. who want to get it. Wait till you read this that. story, okay? <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm just... <laughs> All right, shoot yeah, yeah. No, no, but I do remember that when KPFA was under pressure. I oh, mean, they were 10 years it's, ago. It's part of a network which has been historically a left progressive activist network. But there are some stations within the network that viewed their... They wanted to, you know, give a more corporate mission to the whole network. Because I think there's eight or nine stations in, in that, the network that KPFA is in. And I'm blanking as to what the name of it is. But there's some in Los Angeles, Texas, Washington. And, uh, and some of those stations would have liked to have seen a different approach. And I think they were trying to cut, cut the management out of our local KPFA. Their infrastructure, yeah. absolutely. They yeah. went after that. It's, it's still a valuable thing, terrestrial radio. Um, OK, and let's just look. I mean, this one will probably be talking about, uh, yeah, video. Um, I mean, it, you know, video was later to uh, uh, migrate over into the internet just because the files are bigger. It's harder to, harder to distribute a large file. It takes a long time to download. So, you know, uh, YouTube in 2006 is obviously the major video serving platform. And that's, you know, comes about at a, a time when the penetration of broadband uh, is, is, was enough to really justify uh, a video streaming site like that. And within a year, they were bought by Google. Ask me how much, I'm not sure. I think it was in the billion. It was so close, but we could check that out for sure. So yeah, so let's just back up to the browser wars just uh, as something that we could look at on the, for the end of class today. Didn't television's migration to the web, didn't that come up with a certain laws or rules or policies, I guess, in regards to what television stations could be on the internet? Uh, well, you know, I mean, the, uh, the, the development of that was pretty oppositional, basically, because as we sometimes say, the content of any new medium is old media, and people who turned to YouTube uh, did a lot of posting of their funniest clips from their favorite television shows when it started out, you know. And now I think the networks realize that, uh, you know, nobody may watch The Tonight Show from beginning to end. But uh, advertisers want to advertise on it if, uh, you know, there's a few really good clips of some fun stuff going on on, on, on YouTube, you know. So I, I think they've reconsidered their position as to, you know, uh, allowing people to use small sections of it. Or maybe they're just doing it themselves now and they're more savvy about that. But yeah, there was a Viacom sued uh, Google, which by that time owned YouTube. Uh, for copyright infringement, and that was a billion dollar lawsuit that they went after YouTube. And that, um, uh, again, we should look into, I should look into before next class, the, the exact sequencing of this. But basically, um, um, it was clarified that an internet service provider is not liable for what the people do on the service until they are informed by aggrieved party that copyright's being infringed. So in other words, what that came to would mean that YouTube wouldn't be liable for people sharing or streaming, uh, let's say, CBS material until CBS informed YouTube, hey, someone's infringing copyright, at which point YouTube would immediately have to take it down. So uh, they, didn't, they didn't have that, they didn't have that you know, manpower there to start <coughs> off with. And there's been a lot of complaints from users that they're too draconian in their, um, in their uh, taking stuff down. You know? but, so that's where we're at now, is that was established. That, so I remember you know, visiting Disney and them saying, you know, the, the, basically the legal department said they're writing cease and desist, cease and desist letters constantly you know, just to protect Disney property. That as soon as they put something out on pay-per-view, somebody copies it. And you know it'll go in torrent, which you know the government is still working on closing down. But uh, you know people will also post it immediately into YouTube or I guess now Facebook or whatever. And, and Disney has to constantly inform them. Ah, okay, there's an infringement. There's an infringement. There's an infringement, and then they have to take it down. So that's that's kind of what I know about that. But as to the 
how that actually played out. I think Viacom versus Google was a big point for that. Jenny? Um, a few things. One, if you could backtrack a little bit and really narrowly in a sentence or two uh, define internet versus www because I still have sort of a vague idea uh -huh. of the difference between the two. And number two, I'm a little bit, I don't know, digitally unsavvy. I'm not sure what Napster is. Okay. Well. And then, uh, on a quick final note, I did actually meet somebody earlier this year that actually works for YouTube in the legal department to scan all YouTube channels to specifically go ahead and inform the user, okay, your copyright infringement, and then they block them and they shut them down. Oh, interesting. Wow. That might be great to have somebody like that as a guest speaker or something. If, if I can find her info, I'll, I'll turn that yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. I mean, uh, uh, as, as regards to the internet versus the World Wide Web, I mean, the, the internet is, uh, you know, the network of computers, uh, each of which will have uh, a unique identifier, which is, you know, we, t we talked about DNS, right? The, the, uh, oh, it's here, okay. So the domain name system, right? Uh, so um, that leads us into the World Wide Web. I mean, if you've noticed, You'll have a www dot, uh, you know, Amazon, let's say, dot com, and then whatever. Uh, Too much code. Shoes or something like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, something like that. Uh, and, and, of course, the full thing will appear in your browser probably as something like that, right? So, so with it on, on the internet, which is these interconnected uh, computers, uh, the World Wide Web is a particular protocol. So um, when, you know, there are various ways of exchanging information over the internet. Um, there's also something, you could see something like FTP, right? File transfer protocol. So uh, FTP would be uh, if you want to uh, send, send some uh, files onto a server for some reason. So you could share them or just store them there. So I could, from this computer, I could FTP files uh, up to a server. So that would use uh, the domain name system of, of, the, uh, of the internet, but it wouldn't be coding what's going on there in terms of the hypertext transfer protocol, which is the basis of the World Wide Web. So in any web address, you'll see the first thing it starts out with is telling the computers that are involved that are on the internet, that they're saying, okay, we're using hypertext transfer protocol here. And that is the protocol of the World Wide Web. Why is there an S at the end of some? That's a secure. So it may just say HTTP, but more and more you're seeing S, which means that it's a, a site that's verified through uh, the domain name system. So usually you're seeing an S. But the main thing is here, it's your hypertext transfer protocol. And this is telling it, OK, you're in the World Wide Web using the hypertext transfer protocol. Look for a server which is operated by Amazon, and look on that server for a folder which says shoes. I mean, of course, this would be, you know, da 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 da, da or many folders within folders that would serve up. Eventually, you'd probably get a file which ended like that, you know, like shoe.html or something like that. Uh, so this whole way of representing resources, which, yes, you know, this would be called a URL. Uh, so this whole way of representing resources would be part of the World Wide Web. In fact, it's probably a defining part of the World Wide Web. It's using hypertext transfer protocol. It knows how it's sending information back and forth. And it's, it's storing the information, making it available on the web. Uh, through this kind of hierarchy of, of, uh, of uh, server folders and eventually actual pages that are on the folder. Yes. So the as you as your term was hierarchy the the entire 
chain there, the entire process there would be the World Wide Web, whereas the Internet would be the platform in which that hierarchy gotcha. uh, gets executed. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the Internet would be the actual interconnected computer networks okay. across which different types of data, you know, data could be sent in different ways. The FTP doesn't use this type of address system. Uh, you know, but, but things on the web are identified this way with what they call a uniform resource locator. So it's the way that it works. Yeah. So I don't know if that was a great description, but that's one way I'd come to it. Other, other questions or stuff? We don't have time to look at this 20 minute video that I kind of queued up there. But yeah, Gio? Um, I'm kind of curious about the whole fair use thing and how, like, Notice that some YouTube, there's like a lot of YouTube streams for shows like Rick and Morty and King of Hell, but it seems like they're always on there and that the companies don't really say anything about it. Hmm, yeah. Which is kind of weird. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, um, Let's see. I mean, there's there's certain dodges that I've noticed. For instance, one is uh, you know you've got your full screen and then you put the actual program in a tiny little window like that. Have you guys seen that? Or if you, yeah, if you discolor some videos or put yeah. white, you have white glimmer and then like kind of reverse it. Or... So there's some kind of modification of the uh, of the content. Yeah, yeah. customize it. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, you know, uh, fair, fair use is an exception to the copyright laws, which uh, is designed on the, on the idea that, yes, creators should get, you know, compensated for their work, but also that it's not good for a culture or a society <coughs> to completely tie everything up to, you know, under copyright. So that's why there's a limit to the duration of copyright which is, I think right now is the, uh, the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years or something like that. But after that, it falls into public domain, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, after that, you can, you know, take Paschal Bell's canon and, you know, turn it into your next song or something, and, and you don't owe Paschal Bell or his survivors any money. So that's why copyright expires. And then there's also fair use within copyright, which means under certain conditions, you, you, you are allowed to use parts of an original work without getting the permission of the copyright holder, which getting the permission often means paying the money, right? A licensing fee. That would be up to you and the copyright holder. So fair use covers a number of things, but uh, uh, you know, part of it is do you, do you profit from what you're using it for? Uh, so on YouTube, there are, for instance, They'll let you post some stuff which infringes, but they'll say, okay, you can't monetize this. Uh, whatever, whatever money is made off of this will be given to somebody else, the copyright holder. So you can get some copyright material up there, but you don't profit from it. Uh, in an educational context, which is where, where I know a little more, because you know, obviously teaching the classes, I try to make sure people don't you know, run off and infringe. Uh, so in an educational uh, situation, uh, fair, fair use would suggest that you can use uh, uh, copyright material, parts of it, without seeking permission. However, it can't be the whole work. You have to demonstrate that you have uh, uh, done something uh, to change the intent of the work. So that means you can't just copy a half hour sitcom. You can't even copy a small part of it. But in an educational situation, you could do a review of a show. You could say, well, this show is funny for this reason, and then show a clip. So what you're doing is you're changing the intent of, of uh, what, whatever it is that you're using. You're taking it from being a piece of entertainment and turning it into an educational document. Um, so they're looking at, have you used the whole thing? Have you changed the intent or modified it in some other way? Um, so, uh, and it's important to understand that um, Fair use is, uh, is adjudicated in the courts. Um, there's, no, um, there's no tried and true list of things. Although uh, my colleague Patricia Aufteheider, I think that's how you spell it, um, she's written a whole book which examines all of the different uh, court decisions that relate to fair use. 
Um, so, so this is the idea that it's basically, we'll tell you what you can usually get away with, but that doesn't guarantee that you won't actually get taken to court. And if you do get taken to court, it's the judge who will finally decide on whether you have met the, you know, the, the conditions for fair use. So that's, that's kind of it. So I'd recommend that book or just looking on, um, I can find you a website where the government actually lays out, you know, the ideas about fair use. So, uh, and when in doubt, ask for permission or pay for permission. Like if you're making a film that you intend to actually profit from, uh, don't just take you know that great 30 seconds of music, because that you may have to completely re-edit your thing afterwards, because you'll get you know a letter saying that they'll sue you if you actually publish with that their stuff. So. Okay, well next class let's let's look at. Um, a bunch of stuff that I realize that I have to look up for you guys regarding <laughs> policy and stuff like that. And then also the net neutrality and privacy issues and, that have emerged around the internet. Have fun and we'll see you Thursday.